Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter number 32. Uh, one of my favorite stories or illustrations that Moses uses. And I think you all understand uh, the book of Deuteronomy. I've done some material on it and went through a series on Sunday morning. We got through most of the Old Testament. Uh, uh, Deuteronomy means the second reading of the law. Deuter is to, Deuteronomy is, um, is uh, reading. And so uh, Deuteronomy is the second reading of the law. The first generation God led out of Egypt. They uh, came to Kadesh Barnea and uh, they disobeyed God. They refused to go in and uh, uh, so God said, all right, go back out in the wilderness until the entire adult generation is gone and then I will take your children and lead them in. Well, 38 years went died out, except for two, Joshua and Caleb. Even Moses didn't get to go in uh, to the promised land. And so now the second generation, this is on the eve uh, of going into Canaan, and so Moses teaches the second generation uh, about the Lord, the law, uh, faith, Trusting the Lord, obeying the Lord, and uh, he also reviews the history of that first generation and why they couldn't do it and what they had done. And mostly, he wants to encourage them about how God will go with them and God will care for them, just like he did the first generation, in spite of all. And then he uses, I just love this illustration about the eagle. Deuteronomy 32, uh, let's begin in verse number 9. And we're kind of jumping into the middle of the chapter, but I thought about starting in verse number 1, but the first eight verses would really take me too far adrift from where I want to go with this. So Deuteronomy 32, verse 9, For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. God personally picked the Jewish people. God personally picked that nation to be his people. He calls them his inheritance. Uh, for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot or belonging of the people that belong to God. They're God's inheritance. By the way, since in the New Testament they were put on the back burner for a while and we're now the Lord's intention, that's true for us too in a spiritual sense, not in a physical sense, but even in a spiritual sense. We are the Lord's people and, uh, and he counts us, God he counts, counts us his inheritance. He, that is the, the Lord, found him uh, Jacob, people, uh, his nation, in a desert land, that's Egypt, and in the waste, howling wilderness. Uh, several of the old timers, like Pink and, uh, and uh, Spurgeon, and, and I think even Matthew Henry once or twice, always use this statement, the waste, howling wilderness, as a fit description for the world that we live in. For the Christian, this really is what it is. It's a waste, howling wilderness. He led them about, talking about Jacob and his people. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. And folks, that is true of every believer today. Uh, he leads us. He teaches us through the Word of God. He keeps us as the apple of the eye. Christians are not much appreciated in this life, but we are God's special people. And He loves us and He cares for us and He takes care of us. And then this, I love this illustration. As an eagle stirs the 
up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. Uh, usually the eagle nest is very high, sometimes in cracks of rock, sometimes in very high places. And uh, those little chicks are just really comfortable in that nest. They're warm, they're fed. You know, kind of like some kids we know today. I mean, they grow up and it's time to leave the nest. And why? The bills are paid by mom and dad. Mom was a good cook. You know, and then you got to do something to get them out of the house. Uh, all they didn't at my house was I was the only kid there. I had displeased my mother by uh, surrendering to the ministry instead of what they wanted me to do. And when I turned 18 I got, I, I, and, and got out of school, I mean literally, she went to the door, she opened it, and she said, go and don't come back. Oh. Yeah, well, and I did go and I did not come back. I did go back a few times to visit. But, uh, but uh, you know, you, the point is, you can understand those little chicks. Man, they're comfortable. Well, Mama knows better. There's a time they're not ever going to learn to fly or be independent. So she she flutters over them. She does her best to scare them out of there. And so finally, she just breaks up the nests and kicks them off. Well, <laughs> but she is a good mama. She flies under and under those wings. She catches them, and they just keep doing that till finally they learn to fly. You see the hand of God in that for us, His children. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, you can. So, so, in other words, like the eagle, so the Lord alone did lead him. Folks, you can't trust anybody else, not even yourself, to get through this life. Jeremiah made a very strong statement when he said, the way of man is not in him. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. John said, uh, we don't even know how to pray without the help of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says, we, can, we don't know how to study the Bible without the Lord. The Lord be lead him, and there's no strange God with him. Well, that was at the beginning. And of course, that didn't last uh, for, for that second generation that went in Canaan. They did good for a while, but it did not last. There are three great thoughts here that I want to impress on you. And then I want to go to the New Testament and show you the same thing in the New Testament. What we get out of this interesting little scenario that Moses was teaching that young generation that was fixing to go into Canaan. Number one, they had a great God. They had a great God. The Lord alone did lead him. Folks, we don't have anybody that can su successfully lead us except the Lord, and only the Lord can lead us right. David has something to say about that. Uh, in 1 Chronicles 29, actually, that whole last chapter is some kind of an amazing chapter of what David knew about God. In 1 Chronicles 29, look at verse 11 and 12. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Great God. 
Moses said this in, back in 32, uh, chapter 32, verse number 4. He is our rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are judgment, in other words, right. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. God has never made a mistake. God has never told a lie. God has never given wrong instruction. God has never steered anybody wrong. God has never not been there when you and I needed rescuing. <clears throat> Moses was impressing with those young people with, with the truth. They serve a great God and God will take care of them. There's a second thought, which is obviously what would have to be the next thought. Um, you can say about us, you can say about all of you, humanity, we have a great need. Our need is the Lord. We are like children lost in the wilderness without the Lord. We have a great need. It's described in this statement, the eagle stirreth up the nest. The eagle stirs up the nest. They're comfortable. We don't like to have our nest stirred up. We like our life planned and organized, and it bugs us when we're kicked out of our routine. Amen. And so, like the eagles, God sometimes just has to stir up the nest kick us out of our comfort zone, get us to move on, and by the way, never to hurt us, always to help us. That mother never kicks those eagles out of the nest to kill them. She knows it's the only way that they'll learn to fly, to be independent, and to do what eagles do. Well, God knows what to do with us. He, he allows those needs to come into our life. He stirs up our nest, never to hurt us, <coughs> to kill us. But to, but to move us on where he wants us to be. Amen. David said, yeah, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod, that's discipline, thy staff, that's protection. They comfort me. We all have needs. We will to the day we die. God knows that. And he knows better what we need than we know what we need. So you have a great God, a great need. And then obviously number three, I want you to notice a great deliverance. And that great deliverance from God is exemplified uh, in uh, the eagle beareth them on her wings. Those little chicklets, flap those insufficient little things and going down, and that mother get comes along in time, and they are delivered. We'll be in heaven before we realize how many times the Lord has delivered us, and we didn't even know. We fumed and fussed because something we prayed for didn't happen, or we didn't get away about something where God short-circuited our, our, our plans. When we get to heaven, we're going to praise Him for the first million years for a lot of prayers He didn't answer, and for a lot of plans we had that he did wreck. Bear them on their wings. And then the little word, so. The Lord did lead them. Psalm 50, 15, call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Now, want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We have the counterpart. First of all, in the first 11 verses of, uh, well, the first half of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul reviews briefly, in just a few verses, pretty much what Moses took the whole book of Deuteronomy to do. Uh, the journeys of Israel, the leadership of the Lord in their life. And he applies all that to the New Testament church. He says,
says, There hath no trial taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tried above that ye are able, but will with that trial make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. And he uses pretty much the material of the book of Deuteronomy to do that. And he said all that history is for our learning. Remember, uh, Paul said in Romans 15, 4, whatsoever things were written aforetime were, were written for our learning. Uh, those are not just pretty stories in the Old Testament. Uh, th those were people who lived lives and God taught them and, and, and they didn't have what we have. We have this. And shame on us if we neglect this. Because it's all there, what to do and what not to do and everything else in between. And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, all these things happen unto them and they are examples unto us who live today. So we find the same three principles laid out in different terminology that we found in Moses telling the story of the eagle and her chicks. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I guess I better get there. You're all already there, aren't you? Well, wait for me, okay? I'll get there in a minute. And of course, the, the verse is, verse 13. By the way, Notice verse 11, now all these things were examples unto them. Now verse number 13, they have no temptation. That's our word trial, taken you. By the way, notice taken you. There are a lot of bad stuff comes into your life that, that we didn't ask for. We didn't do anything wrong. It came to us, whether we liked it or not. <coughs> You have no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. I wish, I would love, this is being a little on the vindictive side, I guess, but I would love to go to every big word of faith church and preach a sermon on 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You know, they preach no sickness, no disease, plenty of money, prosperity. What do they do with 1 Corinthians 10, 13 other than they just plain ignore it? Folks, we as Christians go through the same thing that others go through, except unbelievers walk in darkness. Christians walk through darkness. We are delivered by God. We are the, God the God of grace, the grace of God gets us through these things. We have a hope and a help and a comforter that unbelievers don't have. A temptation or trouble, it takes you, but such is his common man, but God is faithful. God is faithful. Boy, you get in a deep enough pickle, and you're going to learn right away that help of man is vain. But God is faithful. Man may not can help you, but God can always help you. Man may not know what to do, but God always knows. Man may not be able to tell you which way you need to go, but God can always tell you which way to go. God is faithful, who will not suffer or permit, that's an old Greek, the English word for permit, who will not permit you to be tempted or tried above that ye are able. Now, I know we are, we've all had crises that were so bad, we think, well, this is it. No. No. God will get you through. By the way, I know he has because you're still here. You're still here. Mm -hmm. And if you ever get a crisis that you don't go through, you'll be with the Lord. So what's the problem? Who will not suffer you above that you're able. God said, I will never put something on you, but that he will give you the grace to bear it. God will either give you living grace or dying grace. By the way, one of the verses that Moses laid in Deuteronomy says unto these same people that we're using as an 
as an example today, Moses said to them, as your days, so shall your strength be. Oh, that's great. That's quite a verse. As your days, so shall your strength be. He'll not suffer you to be tried above that you're able, but will with the temptation. Not a might bail you up. Not you on your own, but no, I, God, I will with that temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Look at the life of David for just a minute. Look at the life, the life of David for Over 110 times life. There were times he just absolutely gave up. There were times he was within an hour being killed by enemies. God got him out of it every time. Look at the New Testament. The Apostle Paul. Did anybody ever suffer more for the cause of Jesus Christ than the Apostle Paul? How many times in prison? How many times? Literally dozens of men at one time after his life. They never got him. So you see the same three things. You see a great God. God is faithful. You see our great need, uh, the temptation that has taken us. And you see a great deliverance that says God will make a way for us to escape. So there, fear not. Slangs that our generation has come up with is we've got this. Well, you know what? That's not true. We don't have anything. I, I like to say God has this. God has you in the palm of his hand. Doesn't mean we're not going to get cancer. Doesn't mean we're not going to go broke. It doesn't mean the house may not burn down. It doesn't mean the insurance may not pay off the car. It, 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 it just means God gets through it. So, 